Hello everyone, my name is Martin and in this video I'm going to talk about the virtualization and its benefits. We start with the basics, what virtualization is and what are the benefits of virtualizing your environment. After that, we'll have a look in the general what the hypervisor and what function does it provides and then we focus on the VMware virtualization platform, vSphere. We'll have a look at two core components of vSphere deployment, ESXi hypervisor and central management solution, vCenter server. And after this theoretical part, we directly jump to the installation and configuration of the ESXi hypervisor. So what is the virtualization? Let's have a look at the following image. On the left side, we have a traditional or legacy approach. We have a physical server and this physical server has several physical devices installed like CPU, memory, disks or network interface cards. On the top of the physical server, there is an operating system and multiple applications are running within that operating system. With such deployment, there are multiple disadvantages. First, you have to scale your physical server for the future. Usually, you do not know what hardware resources will you need in the future, but since you cannot easily reconfigure the server, in most cases, you will buy more resources than you need at the present. Second, there is no high availability. If the physical server fails, your operating system fails as well and will not be accessible unless you either fix the physical server or restore the operating system from the backup. And last not least, in situation where multiple applications are running within a single operating system, it might be quite complicated to secure them and harden the access to the server correctly. Now, let's have a look at the right side when we use a virtualization. The physical server is the same, with the same physical resources as in the first case, but at this time there is a virtualization layer between physical hardware and the virtual operating system. This layer is called the hypervisor and it's responsible for abstracting the physical resources from the virtual servers. Since there is an abstraction, we can assign the only portion of the available resources to each virtual machines, allowing us to assign only necessary resources in a given time. If there is a demand for more resources over the time, we can easily reconfigure our virtual servers and allocate more resources to satisfy the needs. Also, Thanks to the hardware abstraction, we can quickly move the virtual servers around the different physical servers because the virtual servers are not longer tied to the physical hardware. And lastly, since we can create as many virtual servers as we need, we can assign individual applications to individual virtual servers which allows us to better secure and manage the environment. Let's have a look at the benefits of the virtualization. As said, because we can create a multiple operating system on the top of one physical server, we can better share and utilize the compute resources, and when you are using a virtualization, usually you need to have less physical server than before. From the operating perspective, the deployment of new virtual servers is quite fast and straightforward process. Instead of physically installing the server in the data center, configuring the network and storage connectivity, you can easily create a new virtual machine just within a few seconds. Also, the management is much simpler compared to traditional infrastructure. You have just a single management interface where you can do everything. Since there is a virtualization layer between physical hardware and the virtual servers, you are no longer tightened to the physical hardware, so you can easily migrate the virtual servers between different physical hypervisors that leads to the higher availability of your workloads. If one physical server fails, the virtual servers will be automatically restarted on the different hypervisor. So if we summarize the benefit of the virtualization, it saves money and it saves time. So what the hypervisor is? It is a core component of every virtualized environment. Sometimes you might read that the hypervisor is VMM, Virtual Machine Monitor. A hypervisor is responsible for memory and I.O. management between the physical server and the virtual servers. Basically what it does is, 
that it translates the calls from the virtual servers to the physical hardware, schedules the operation on the physical CPU, and connects the I.O. devices like storage and network to the virtual servers. There are two types of hypervisors, Type 1 and Type 2 hypervisor. Type 1 hypervisors are installed directly on the physical hardware. There is no operating system installed at all. The hypervisor is the operating system. Those hypervisors have the best performance and all advanced features like high availability. Type 2 hypervisors are installed on the operating system itself and they are ideal for small lab environments, proof of concepts or testing. Compared to Type 1 hypervisors, they do not provide the best performance because the operating system takes a lot of overhead. For Type 1 hypervisors, it is essential to mention the hardware-assisted virtualization features. Such features allows the native access to the physical hardware from the virtual servers. Today, all modern CPUs have various hardware-assisted virtualization features built to them, but its technology is not limited to the CPU only. For example, you can use a network card with SRIOV functionality to directly map them to the virtual servers without any overhead of the hypervisor itself. Now, when we have covered the very basics, let's have a look at the VMware vSphere. In every vSphere environment, there are two essential components. ESXi hypervisor that runs the virtual servers and vCenter server that manage the entire environment. Let's have a look at the ESXi hypervisor. ESXi hypervisor is type 1 hypervisor that is installed directly on the physical server. It is a tiny piece of software. The installation image is just 350 megabytes large. One thing you need to keep in mind, since the ESXi hypervisor is enterprise class hypervisor, you can install the ESXi hypervisor only on the supported hardware. And from the management perspective, the entire management is done through HTML5 interface and we have DCUI, directly connected user interface for initial configuration and troubleshooting and you can use SSH for troubleshooting the system or command line operations. This is the initial screen of ESXi hypervisor. Later on, we are going to install the ESXi hypervisor and I will show you around the web client so you will be aware of every aspect of the web client. I have mentioned that ESXi hypervisor can be installed only on the supported physical server and the hardware. You should always check the hardware compatibility list if the server and its components are certified and tested. If the component is not on the HCL, it does not mean it won't work, but in case you need to file a support request to the support engineers, they might decline to solve the problem since the hardware is not tested and certified. On the HCL, you can find thousands of tested and certified components along with the correct firmware versions and the driver versions that have been tested for different vSphere versions. Now, when we have covered the ESXi hypervisor, let's have a look at the vCenter server. As said, vCenter server is a central management platform of entire vSphere infrastructure. With the vCenter server, you can manage up to 2,000 ESXi hypervisors and 35,000 virtual servers. Also, keep in mind that for all advanced features like high availability, distributed resource scheduling or live migrations of the virtual servers, you need a vCenter server. Also, with the vCenter server, you can seamlessly integrate with your Active Directory or generic LDAP server for central identity source and you can create a complex roles for different users allowing them to access only specific subparts of the system. This is the web client of the vCenter server. As you can see, compared to the ESXi web client, it is much more complex, but don't worry, I'm going to cover the web management of the vCenter server in the future videos. Now, let's start with the hands-on part. And the first thing we are going to do is to install a new ESXi hypervisor. Let's have a look at the installation of the ESXi hypervisor. Right now, my server is starting and I've already inserted the ISO installation image to the server. In my case, I'm using a nested virtualization, so I'm simulating 
the physical server running as a virtual machine. Depending on your boot options, just make sure that you select the CD-ROM as a boot device. If you do that, and the ISO installation image of the ESXi hypervisor is presented, the boot menu of the ESXi hypervisor will pop up. As you can see, you have two options here. Either you boot the installer, or you will boot from the local disk. At this stage, there is nothing on the physical local device, so let's proceed with the standard installer. Right now, you have an option to add some specific boot commands, and if you don't need to do that, just wait 5 seconds and the installation will be launched. At this stage, the installation files are being loaded, and when it's done, the installation wizard will proceed. It will take just a few seconds, and once the files are loaded, the installation will begin. The installation itself will welcome you with the screen. There is nothing you can do here, so just press enter to proceed with the installation. In the next step, you have to agree with the end user license agreement, so let's do that by hitting F11. Now, the ESXi installer is searching for all available local or remote disks that can be used for installation. In my case, the server has only single 10G local disk device that will be used for installation, but if you have multiple disks, you will see multiple disks presented as a possible destination for the installation. And you can hit F11 to get the details about the destination device. In the disk details, you can double check if you have selected correct disk for installation because you can see the full disk name here. Also, you can see, for example, LAN ID here, the target ID, the capacity, if there is some existing ESXi installation, or if the disk is SSD based. So let's get back to the previous screen by hitting OK, and let's proceed with the installation on the selected disk by hitting Enter key. As a next step, you can select your keyboard layout. This is because in the next step, you will have to define your root password and if you are willing to use some advanced characters that are not presented on the default US keyboard, you have to select the correct one. And again, in my case, I'll just stick with the US default keyboard layout. So let's proceed with the Enter key. In this step, you need to define your root password that will be used for initial configuration. And that's it. All you need to do right now is just proceed with the installation by hitting F11. The installation itself will take roughly one or two minutes, so just be patient here. Once the installation is finished, all that remains is just to reboot your new ESXi hypervisor and it will boot to the directly connected user interface where you can proceed with the initial configuration of the system. So as you have seen, the installation of the ESXi hypervisor is a pretty straightforward process and basically all you need to do is to select the device where it will be used for installation, define your keyboard layout and the root password, and that's it. As you can see, at this time we have successfully booted from the local device and the ESXi hypervisor is initializing. On the left, you can see the version of the ESXi hypervisor that is installed, the hardware platform, and the CPU and memory configuration of your ESXi hypervisor. So as you can see, we have successfully booted our ESXi hypervisor and we are in the directly connected user interface where we can proceed with the initial IP configuration of our ESXi hypervisor. Our brand new ESXi server successfully started, so let's explore the directly connected user interface. DCUI have two main functions. You can use DCUI for troubleshooting your ESXi hypervisor if the network connectivity is not available, but more importantly, when you install ESXi hypervisor, you must configure the management network so you can connect to the system over IP, and this is the most used case for the DCUI. There are several ways how to access the DCUI. The most basic is the physical monitor and keyboard connected to the physical server, but mostly you will use some sort of out-of-band management like HPE ILO or Dell iDRAC depending on your server hardware 
so you do not need to connect anything to the server. This is especially handy if your server is physically installed in the data center, for example. Once you accessed the DCUI, you can identify to which server you are connected. On the left side, you can see the hardware model of the server as well as CPU and memory configuration, and in the bottom part, you can find out the IP address and the hostname of the server. In this case, there is nothing configured yet, so we can see that DHCP lookup failed. Before you can access the configuration of the ESXi, you have to, of course, log in with the valid credentials. After the fresh installation, there is only one user, root. So let's hit F12 to access the system and fill in the root password you have created during the installation. Now you can see what configuration and troubleshooting options are available in the DCUI. So let's explore all possible options first. The first option is to change the root password. Next, we have an option to configure our management network. This option is probably the most used one and we will have a look at the management network configuration in a few minutes. If your server is configured through DHCP and you would like to renew the IP address after some configuration change on the DHCP server, you can use Restart Management Network option. There is also an option to test the management network. This is quite a useful option that you should use after you configure the management network to verify that the ESXi hypervisor can communicate over the network using the IP address you have provided. Another useful option is to restore the network configuration. If, for whatever reasons, you have lost the network connectivity to your ESXi hypervisor, you can roll back all the network configuration and start from the scratch. You can reset the network configuration for standard and distributed networking, or you can reset the network configuration for the whole ESXi hypervisor. If you remember, during the installation of the ESXi hypervisor, there was an option to select the keyboard layout. You can, if you need, change the keyboard layout from DCUI as well. Next option is the troubleshooting. In this menu, you have opportunity to enable ESXi shell or SSH and change the default timeouts for different services. Of course, you have an option to change those values using a web client or SSH as well. The most interesting option here is the restart management agents. Sometimes, the management agents might stop responding. In this situation, you can ping the ESXi host over the network, but when you try to open, for example, web client, the connection won't be successful. As the first troubleshooting option in such situation, you can try to restart the management agents to see if the problem persists. If not, you can continue with the next option in the DCUI, and that is the system log section. Sometimes it might happen that you have lost the access to the network, so you are not able to troubleshoot your ESXi host through the web client or SSH. You can directly access the essential ESXi logs directly from the DCUI, and usually, you will quickly discover what the issue is. The last resort option, you can also reset the whole configuration of the ESXi hypervisor using Reset System Configuration option. If you approve the action, the result will be the same as the reinstallation of the system. So that is for the DCUI options, and now let's have a look at network configuration. To configure our management network, select Configure Management Network option. As you can see, you have several options regarding the management network here. The first option is the network adapters. By default, the first physical network interface card is pre-selected for the management network. Based on your physical topology, you can select multiple physical network interface cards by pressing a space key, and you can have a look at the details for each physical NIC by pressing the D key. In my case, the management network is connected over the first two physical network interface cards, so let's keep both of them selected. The next option is to configure the VLAN of the management network. ESXi hypervisor fully supports VLAN tagging for the management network, 
but by default, the VLAN tag is not configured, meaning that the ESXi hypervisor expects that the frames are untagged. The most important configuration option is to set the IP address. By default, DHCP client is enabled for the management network, but in most of the production environment, you will prefer to set the IP address statically. You also have an option to completely disable the IPv4 if you prefer to use only IPv6 in your environment. In my case, I would prefer to stick with the IPv4, so let's configure the IP address, subnet mask and the default gateway. Since there is no DHCP server in my infrastructure, I have to configure the primary and the secondary DNS servers and the hostname of the system. DNS configuration is not mandatory, but I would strongly suggest to use FQDNs in your infrastructure, not just the IP address, so let's specify the primary and secondary DNS server and the hostname of the system. In the hostname field, you can either fill in just the hostname and then the domain name in the DNS suffixes, or you can configure the whole FQDN as the hostname, which will be my case. And that's it. All you need to do right now is to restart the management network to apply the changes. Now, your server is available on the network, or at least it should be. I strongly suggest testing the management network before you log out from the DCUI using test management network option. The test itself will try to ping several IP addresses as well. It will try to resolve the hostname against the primary DNS server. By default, the ping addresses are pre-filled by the gateway IP address and primary and secondary DNS servers. But you have an option to specify the different IP address you would like to ping. Once you confirm the test, you will see the result of each of the tests. If all of the tests succeed, you can finally try to access the web client of the ESXi hypervisor. So let's open your favorite web browser and fill in the FQDN or IP address. If you access the system for the first time, you need to approve the certificate warning since the self-signed certificate is used to secure the HTTPS communication. Once you do that, log in with the root password you have configured during the configuration and finally, you should be able to access the system. If you access the web client for the first time, the information about the Customer Experience Improvement Program is displayed. What CEIP does is that it sends the anonymized information about the system to the VMware. But don't worry, it will never send anything that can be used to identify the system. For example, the host name, data stores names or the virtual machine names are never sent. Only general information like what the hardware is used, how many CPU sockets does, does the system have or the memory size of the system. So, based on your preferences, keep opted in in the CEIP or not and once you confirm the selection, the web client will be finally displayed.